Welcome to a program we call Perspectives El Paso. I'm Professor Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College. In 1965, I began to teach at a place called Texas Western College and taught there from 1965 to 1967, and at that time they changed the name to UT El Paso. I taught there again as a guest lecturer in 1989 and 1990 while teaching at community college full time. Over the years at UT El Paso, I met a number of interesting people and worked with some very interesting ones. But the most interesting one of all I have as a guest today. His name is Tony Khrushchevsky. Tony, welcome to the show, Perspectives El Paso. Thank you very much for inviting me. And the reason that I said what I said in introduction is because Tony uh, was living in Warsaw, Poland at the start of World War II. And so, Tony, we want to start this program today by you telling us a little bit about your involvement in the beginning of World War II in Warsaw, Poland. Well, uh, this was the real changeover in my life. On the 1st of September 1939, the Nazi planes, the German planes, attacked w Warsaw. And as a scout, I was drafted into fire alert groups, which were forewarning uh, about the bombing of, of, of the city. Mm -hmm. So I was on the roofs of, this, of the city houses alerting the authorities about the fires. And you were just a teenager? I was a teenager, I was 11 years old, as a young scout, okay. Polish scout. And then, of course, four years later, when the Polish resistance began, Poland uh, organized the, the largest, second largest resistance movement in Europe after the Soviet resistance. Poland had a half a million troops in the resistance movement. And I was enrolled in the resistance movement at the age of 15. In 1943. Now you were a spy. What was your most well, dangerous because, because undertaking? Initially, initially they, they tra trained us scouts to know the city, to know the uh, communication routes in case of escape routes and all that kind. And then we were watching for the Germans and observing them, fooling them, changing signs. So they were very often lost in the city. Okay. Uh, we are carrying messages and then volunteering for very dangerous uh, activities very often. And of course, each and every activity like that, you could uh, be immediately either killed on the spot or sent to Auschwitz and, and die there. So I it was very risky business. I recently went to the Holocaust Museum where you made a presentation and you showed this picture and I made a copy at that presentation. We have it here today. You want to tell us about the symbolism of this for yeah. the Polish resistance? Yeah, this is, this is a symbol is connected to some extent, extent with my, my own uh, uh, part in, in the resistance. Uh, this is uh, an anchor, obviously, which is symbol of hope, eternal symbol of hope. At the same time, it's PW, which in Polish means Polska Walcząca, fighting Poland. And we as scouts in the campaign against the Nazis throughout six years of the world were painting this as graffiti on the walls of Warsaw and all other Polish cities, trying to forewarn the Nazis, look out, we are guarding, we are, we are, we are hoping that we'll win and, and watch out because we will be obviously watching you. Now what are these wavy lines in here? And the wavy lines is another symbolism within the symbolism. After defeat, after we lost the, in the Warsaw Uprising and 200,000 people died in the Warsaw Upli Uprising, uh, the members of the resistance movement from Warsaw, right now there are only 4,000 people uh, surviving. At that time there were about 50,000 of them and they had to emigrate and they were scattered all over the world. So okay. the wavy lines were the routes, the w where they ended up in Africa, in, in Europe, in, in all over. I have friends all over the world, in various countries of the world. So they ended up traveling through the various routes, but still remembering what, what was their task of the standing up to the Nazis, to the, to the terror of the Nazis. Now you were the leader of about a hundred people. Yeah, I uh, was. What the, was the most frightening thing that you did? Well, uh, I, was, uh, I was enrolled at the age of 15 and within one year, of course, Nazis were hitting us hard and destroying the leadership of, uh, so every year a new leadership had to emerge. So within one year, I became a commander of 100 young boys and, and uh, we were uh, be preparing for, for the uprising. We had to watch just before the uprising, we were supposed to watch the, uh, the German troops going through Warsaw and counting them, uh, assessing their strength. And then I was supposed to notify the, 
notify the authorities whether there are more Germans right now in the city or less. And the biggest challenges and the biggest frightening things were during the Warsaw Uprising, when we were cut up into pieces and the only mode of communication, we were receiving our orders from London because the Polish government was in London throughout the war and the Polish army of quarter million was fighting on all the fronts in the Western, Western world. But we were commanded from London and the, the radios were shut. So we had to carry messages. And again, I volunteered for uh, the most dangerous, I remember distinctly, mm -hmm. for the most dangerous uh, miss mission to carry message from the headquarters in the, of the Pol Warsaw Uprising to the partisan units, guerrilla units outside of Warsaw. And I had to go to sewers about three times for about uh, five miles each trip. And I nearly drowned there. And I was saved by a girl who said, no, you have to survive. Did you, you have some girls that joined your group? Oh yeah, th there were plenty of girls and girls were actually braver than boys were. They were totally devoted and they were leaders very often. And the carriers leading us through the sewers were girls. So the girl was about 17 years old and I was dying. I was just give, trying to give up and uh, allow myself to drown. And, and she said, no, you can't die. I don't know her name. I know her only as Marta, her pseudonym, because we went by pseudonyms. I was Jupiter. My pseudonym was Jupiter and she was Marta. And, and, and I wrote about her in one of the articles, uh, you know, it, I know she probably died during the Warsaw Uprising, but she said, no, you cannot die. You have to work after the war, rebuild the country and introduce democracy, you know, reintroduce democracy and all that. So those are the brave people who really suffered. And of course, most of them died. As I said, uh, of, of the uh, res resistance movement, uh, out of 50,000, about half of us di died. About 18,000 went uh, into POW camps uh, in, G in Germany. Now your mother died, right? My mother died in the Nazi concentration camp because she asked the German SS officer for mercy. The Germans were dividing families but purposely. And she, in perfect German, uh, asked her uh, for mercy for her. And that infuriated the Nazi officer so much that he sent her to concentration camp and she died there in Ravensbury concentration camp by Berlin. Well, we could spend a long time. We could spend two or three programs <laughs> just on the resistance yeah. fighting. Now, let's talk about you. Weren't you at some point captured and put in a concentration yeah, camp? Well, or no, a POW I was in a POW camp? camp. I was, you know, I was uh, uh, after the uh, at the end of the uprising. Uh, initially, they didn't take prisoners at all. They were shooting all the prisoners, all the wounded people were killed actually. But because of the bluff which the American and British government uh, <coughs> performed. They, they notified the German authorities that if they continue killing us in Warsaw, uh, there will be a re retribution against the German POWs in America. Of course, this was a bluff, right. but that saved my life because they took 18,000 people prisoner and I, was, I spent one year in the POW camp in West Germany. And so, so even some people died even in the POW camp because we were were uh, underfed and, and there was TB and all, all sorts of t terrible things and of course uh, malnu malnutrition, but, but luckily I survived the POW camp. Now you used the, wor <coughs> the word hope while ago in regard yeah, to this yeah, symbol. Yeah. That's what kept you going? Yeah, exactly, exactly. The spirit of uh, resistance and spirit of, to some extent, retribution, vengeance for all the terror with the, with the Germans, with the Nazis created in, in, in occupied Europe. Did you see pe people dying around you of in course, despair? Was, they gave up hope? Constantly, constant, constant bloodshed. You know, for every German we killed simply to pay penalty for what they done, they immediately shot 100 people and they stopped streetcars, buses, and they will machine gun in front of the bus and in front of the streetcar, 100 people who were counting methodically, 98, 99, 100 and machine gun, and then post their names on the walls. So they, that gave us spirit of resistance to some extent. There was an enormous uh, feeling of, of resistance. A number of years ago, when I first started teaching at community college in 1972, I had a student who had been a Jeep driver for General Patton in mm -hmm. Germany. At the time, they went in and liberated yeah. the area and opened up the uh, concentration camps. And he showed me pictures he had taken. They were so horrible, just so horrible. Uh, uh, tell me about that. How were you liberated? Well, I was liberated by the, uh, all, at the end of the war, 29th of April 1945, of all the people by the Canadian uh, detachments of the, uh, of the uh, f Second British Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
the, the last German I saw was probably my age, also 17. They were escaping like rabbits, sc scattered rabbits, because the, those huge tanks came out of the forest. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, we were cheering. There were 30,000 of, uh, of, of the prisoners in our camp, Zandbostel, Stalag uh, 10B, of about the nine nationalities, different nationalities, Br Americans, British, Poles, variety of Frenchmen, variety of nationalities. Were you emaciated? Were you well, yeah, it, because we were very poorly fed, and it was all usually rotten food, rotten cabbage usually, and we were in the marshes. They, they, they built the camps, POW camps in the marshes, and they told us to, to do the job. It was, in a sense, it saved us also because they forced us to work, but it was kind of silly work, digging trenches supposedly to uh, drain the marshes, but, but and then the other group would cover this up or whatever. So, but at least you had something to do during the nine months I was in POW camp. But 60, 60 of my colleagues died in, in within the block which I was lo located in. Now, what did you do immediately after being liberated? Uh, after you, did I liberated, you join the forces or no, something? No, I, I wanted to rejoin, uh, I wanted to go to, uh, to the uh, international headquarters of a scouting movement in Amsterdam in Holland. Okay. So I appropriated a, a bicycle from the Germans. And I, uh, I created a funny situation that I had weapons. Of course, I didn't have weapons. So we pretended we, we, pretended we had weapons in our pockets. Okay. And it turned out they were escaped SS men, and they had weapons we didn't. Luckily, they didn't start <laughs> shooting because they were scared. Yeah. And within half an hour, they were arrested by the, by the Britishers and, and sent to another camp. And on the bicycle, we pedaled to Holland. Uh, uh, and it was incredible because all the all these roads were mined and it's incredible but after a couple of days we got to the border of Holland and then one morning uh, I was staying in the farmer's house and uh, there was a great commotion and what happened was suddenly I saw a horrendously large tank a Polish tank Polish armor division was fighting in Germany at that time oh, against okay. the Nazis they were they were uh, around Wilhelmshaven, a German port, and uh, the colonel came out of the of the tank said, "I have a son in Warsaw uprising. D by any chance, do you know him?" And of course, we didn't know him. But said, "Hop in, we'll take." So I uh, I rejoined the Polish army under British command, and and uh, but I didn't want to stay there because my mother said, first and foremost, you have to finish your education." So, so they arranged for me to go to England to, to continue my education because there was a Polish government, Polish schools in England th throughout the war. So how did you transition then from England to the United well, States? Well, I never got to England because at that time they recognized the Polish communist government in Poland. Oh. Britain, America, uh, Britain, America and, and Soviet Union recognized Polish communist government in Warsaw right. and Polish government in, in uh, England was de-recognized. So instead of that, they sent us to, the, to Italy to rejoin po Second Polish Corps of General Anders, which took Monte Cassino in the Southern Campaign. Okay. And I joined the, the uh, Cavalry Regiment there, which I, and I eventually, uh, they, they sent me to school there. So, so I didn't waste time. By the time of the oc occupation of Italy, I got my di high school diploma, actually. So you're going from there, then you came from Italy to the United States? And then they demobilized us, but since Poland was sort of sold down the river to the communists, by the by the great powers so the british didn't know what to do with us so they they simply said okay we will demobilize you in england so they took us to england and demobilized and i became part of the british army and demobilized from the british army oh, okay. and then they found employment for us so so i i worked in england for seven years but i realized very rapidly that because of the atrocious conditions of post-war conditions in in england they had rationing until 1952 everything wow. was rationed and there were plenty of returning POWs, English POWs. So as a foreigner, I thought I don't have chances. And my, my mother always wanted me to be a professor and, and finish uh, university. So I decided to go to America. So, so I saved a, a lot of money, $51, and I went across the ocean oh to America. Word. But luckily, US Congress passed a special law admitting 18,000 Polish ex-servicemen, a special amendment to the, to the law. Um, uh, uh, allowing us to join and, and we were allowed in, in 1952 I immigrated to the United States. Now you went to Chicago where there was well, a large Well first, first I went to ch Chicago because you had to be sponsored. 
So I got a sponsor from Chicago. Oh, okay. Somebody had to sponsor you. Then I found myself a job, and it was easy. It was a Korean War at that time, and and then I started working, and and then going to evening classes. And uh, of course, uh, then uh, I saved enough money and I uh, wanted to hit the University of Chicago. First, they didn't want to admit me. I went to Northwestern and then went back to Chicago. They admitted me after, after the fact. But the, why I emigrated? Because in England, you couldn't get education. You had only, uh, in the evening, you could only get uh, some selected classes, but you couldn't get a diploma. Specialized training. Yeah, special yeah. training, but you couldn't. So, so I, w I took commerce courses in England, but I, but I couldn't hope at all to, to go and, and get a degree in, in, in from university because I didn't have money. Yeah. And at that time, university was for the privileged few who had money. Now, this is a short program. We only have 28 minutes of taping. Uh, here we are in, uh, in uh, May of 2010. Transition here at the conclusion yeah. of our program. How well, did you end up to El Paso well, in the desert? Well, places. I, I, I always, I was always fascinated by the borders, and from Chicago, I found myself a first job after my PhD in international relations from the University of Chicago. I ended up teaching in SUNY State University of New York on the border of Canada and Quebec because I was fascinated by the uh, Quebec uh, American border. Right. And then within two years, uh, this was the, the college was developing and. I wasted so much time during the war, so I wanted to obviously make up time. So after two years, when I got an offer from UTEP, I jumped at the opportunity and it was from one border to another, so it was even more attractive. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in, in, in El Paso. I liked the El Paso, and my wife liked El Paso from the very beginning, and, and we stayed here. Instead, I came for five years and st ended up, uh, after 42 years, still liking El Paso and going, being a good ambassador for El Paso, actually, because I always talk about El Paso. Now, your research and writing, it's primarily been about the border? And well, uh, partly, you know, initially it was uh, on uh, Soviet uh, uh, affairs, Russia, Soviet affairs, Poland. Mm -hmm. But then, because of the situation here, I started writing books. So I have a couple of books on, on, on the border and, and uh, my recent uh, contribution is uh, partly edit I com uh, edited a book with some of my colleagues on, on drug wars in, along the border. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the colleagues that we have had at UT El Paso. We had a fascinating group of colleagues. I am one of the survivors of that group. Only two of us, Professor Graves and myself, are still uh, teaching. But uh, we had 17 professors which were extremely good. Some of them were of uh, international repute. Professor uh, Cook right. from England, from uh, London School of Economics, uh, uh, student of Keynes and, and, and of great fame. And he started a graduate program at, 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 at uh, was responsible for graduate program in political science at UTEP. Professor Mel Strauss, uh, Professor Ed Leonard, uh, Dick Bath, a variety of people who contribute greatly to the knowledge of the border, knowledge of the of Southwest, uh, interrelations. And obviously, we liked it so much, for instance, that my wife started studying Spanish after, after we came here and got her BA and an MA in, Sp in Spanish, wrote a thesis in Spanish, and then taught for 15 years Spanish, a Polish-American girl <laughs> teaching Spanish at San Clemens. Only here. in America. Yeah, only in America. <laughs> now, what's her first name? June. June. Well, and, well, she, and it was, with a, you know, uh, she was the best program in Spanish because she was demanding both of Anglos and, 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 and Mexican-Americans of high standards. Right. And she was embracing at the same time at the same demanding a great deal. So for 15 years she was teaching at San Clemens. You know, this is right. only in America. Right. And the, the same, Leo, the same thing is, uh, I cannot see a, a immigrant just of the boat embarking on a career of teaching, teaching in political science, essentially teaching students about their own country. Uh, people with my accent teaching, uh, teaching uh, about America. Right. So this is, this no nowhere except probably Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. There are only three, four countries where this would be possible. Nowhere they can foreigners, immigrants can teach archaeology, languages, literatures, but never political science, and especially about the government. 
Do you think there's kind of a complacency, though, that many people just take it for granted? We have all these things with, you paid a severe price. Of course. Yeah. For freedom and for liberty. Yeah. You know? Well, uh, you, had to, you had to pay price, obviously. You always have to pay price in life for what you believe in. If you want to, be, if you want to really stand up and, 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 and believe in something. Right. Well, we're still young people, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, what's your next goal? What's your next achievement that you want to reach? Well, uh, you know, I'm active. I, right now I am teaching summers, as if it would be enough to teach at UTEP. I'm teaching summers in the University of Warsaw program. And uh, this is a program which I've been engaged in for 19 years now, ever since communist collapse in Poland. Uh, I, I engage in that program and we are teaching, this is a summer school, and we're teaching junior professors from former Soviet Union. I had students from Kazakhstan, U Ukraine, Russia, U Be 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 Belarus. Belarus, Ukraine, variety of countries. And we are teaching them this international body professors, the Americans, Britishers, French, Poles, and they want to show to the, to the uh, people from Russia, former Soviet Union that we are teaching the same things. The same th I'm teaching about civil rights, minorities, feminism, those kind of things which uh, the, young, the young professors never heard from their professors because their, their professors were communists. I'm sure you've had some sit-down conversations with some of the people here that were in concentration camps oh, yeah. in Germany sure, and sure. Poland and sure, other sure. places and people at the Holocaust yeah, Museum. Yeah, sure. Um, well, tell us about that. Tell us about what kind of experiences you feel when you talk to these people and what they went through, the hope that brought them to where they well, are. Well, it's, it's frightening. Initially, of course, the hope uh, brought them to manage to enable them to survive. Then for many, many years, and this was true also to some extent with me, we never talked about what, we, what happened. We closed the book right. and we never talked. It's only about 10, 15, 20 years later that we started talking about it. So this is the tragedy of many of the Holocaust survivors uh, because they, they simply uh, were unable to share those experiences. It was right. frightening. But right. essentially it was belief, belief in humanity, belief in freedom, uh, liber liberty, tolerance, which brought them through and uh, managed to, uh, they managed to survive. But basically they had to be relatively healthy right. because most of them died because they simply could not put up with the torment. Now you said it was a miracle for you to survive so you could tell the story. Uh, you've been to Poland to tell your story. Oh, some yes, of it's documented yes. there in yes, some of the museums. Yes, as a matter of fact, they, they opened the Museum of Warsaw Uprising and I recorded two films of two hours and I am on the 24 hour basis uh, my rec recounting some of the episodes. Mm -hmm. So my colleagues at UTEP are laughing that when they visited Warsaw, they, they never realized that they have a <laughs> colleague who is a living exhibit in the museum. A loop. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's how it is. But you know, the funny thing was the museum was opened only recently, six years ago, because the communists never allowed to, to uh, open the museum because they were, uh, obviously this was a museum, muse museum about freedom fighting, about uh, right. ideas, and they wouldn't tolerate that such a museum. So only when communism collapsed in Poland, in 1989, and democracy and capitalism came back when they reopened opened the museum. And just recently, there was a plane crash yeah. in Russia that had the president of Poland. The president, and, and unfortunately, a lot of top leaders, including six commanders of all the branches of Polish and army. You knew some of those people. Yeah, didn't I knew you? some of the on the on the plane. Uh, as a matter of the director of that museum, changed places at the last moment, so survived, and I know him very well. Oh. And another person volunteered to go, was supposed to go because the larger delegation went by train. And she was supposed to go by train and at the last moment she changed places and instead went by, by, by plane and, and of course died with, together. So c'est la vie, that's, that's yeah, life. Know. Well, you, you told us the story in, uh, on several occasions in the past about at one point when you were a res resistance freedom fighter that you went down the basement to get some uh, Coke bottles with gasoline for Molotov cocktails. And while you were down there, the people upstairs you just left were all wiped out yeah. in an explosion. When I came back, it was a shock because there was not a single survivor. And I was only by a fate, by fate that I was sent by a commander to get more gasoline for Molotov cocktails. And if I wouldn't be out for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes out in the cellar, I would be wiped out. Also, this was the second day of the uprising in Warsaw in 1944. Right. So, so the, very often your life is directed that way. 
And then uh, on one end, in, in spite of the terror of everything, at the same time I have to add another comment. When I was captured by the Germans, uh, a German who was guarding me was telling me, look, you are going to be killed tomorrow, so you have to escape. I cannot help you because I'm anti-Nazi, but you have to escape. And of course I listened to him and by miracle I escaped. And if they had known he did that, he could have been yeah, killed. Exactly. He said, I cannot help you. And I don't know his name, and he was, a, he was a good human being, a soldier, but he said, I cannot obviously release you or, or allow you to escape, but, but you have to do everything because tomorrow they will, they will kill you. Yeah. And there's a plaque on the, on the building, and of course my name is missing from that plaque, <laughs> simply because <laughs> this, this isn't German, so you cannot blame the whole nation. Right. You, have to bla you have to really believe in individual huma humanity of individual people. Right. Well, we just have a couple of minutes left, so any last comments you'd like to, for the audience to know before we close out this program today? It's been a pleasure having well, you. Well, thank you, Leon. Uh, that the, obviously, uh, the, 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 in spite of the horror and the tragedy of the Warsaw Uprising, incidentally, there were two uprisings in Warsaw, one in the ghetto uprising, 1943, where 80,000 Jews were destroyed and the whole ghetto was destroyed, and the Warsaw Uprising, a year later, in 1944, in August, 200,000 people died. So it means that it was for 63 days we fought. It was 3,000 people per day, equivalent to the uh, t t trade towers in 9-11. In oh, oh my, what a comparison. Yeah. Well, those of you watching today, you realize when I introduced this program, I said I had one of the most interesting people that I ever met at UT El Paso. And we're glad that, uh, Tony, you have been here today with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. Keep the me. faith, keep up the hope. Thank you very much. We hope those of you out there will tune in again and we'll have some more interesting guests in the future on a program we call Perspectives El Paso. Mm -hmm.